Tonight, testing NATO's unity, the decisions dividing allies and dominating the agenda ahead of a major summit. Clashes over cluster munitions. It's going to be a political bombshell. And Ukraine's membership bid. I think it's premature to say, to call for a vote, you know. As Canada's prime minister faces more pressure to increase defense spending. We need the capabilities if we're going to be a serious military. Plus, port workers in B.C. return to the bargaining table. We've stood up and said enough is enough. The strike stretching into its second week, forcing businesses to sound the alarm. And a shared love over literature. As much as writing gave my life purpose, my life gave my life meaning. The dystopian fantasy turned real life romance. National News with Sandy Ronaldo reporting tonight. Todd Vander Hayden. Good evening. A big week ahead for NATO. The military alliance has a crucial summit coming up in Lithuania. And at the very top of the agenda, the war at NATO's own borders. Um, but some cracks are starting to show over when or even whether to allow Ukraine to join. And disagreement over a controversial move by the United States to supply Ukraine with cluster munitions to fight Russia. More than 100 countries, including Canada, have banned those bombs. CTV's John Venavalli Rao has more on NATO at a crucial crossroads. Facing new divisions among allies, the U.S. president arriving in Europe, ahead of what promises to be an historic NATO summit starting Tuesday. Walk through. Coming amid a grinding Ukrainian counteroffensive and tensions over the U.S. decision to send Ukraine cluster munitions. Despite concerns, they pose a danger to civilians. U.S. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby today defending the decision, saying regular artillery is now in short supply and cluster bombs are being offered up until America can provide other ammo. So we're going to send these additional artillery shells that have cluster bomblets in them uh, to help bridge the gap as we ramp up production of normal 155 artillery shells. More than 100 countries have banned cluster bombs, including key NATO allies who will no doubt bring it up at the meeting in Lithuania. Though the move winning praise from some Biden critics back home. They are highly effective and particularly hitting flanks of troops um, inside of Ukraine. Uh, they would be a game changer in the counteroffensive. NATO leaders will also have to decide on how Ukraine could eventually get membership into the alliance with the U.S. president saying now is simply not the time. I don't think it's ready for membership in NATO, but here's the deal. I don't think there is unanimity in NATO about whether or not to bring Ukraine into the NATO family now, at this moment, in the middle of a war. Also up for discussion, Sweden's push to join NATO, something that's been blocked by Turkey. Security at the site where the leaders will meet is extremely tight. Lithuania borders with Russian ally Belarus. To help protect the summit, German Patriot air defense missiles have been deployed. As for Vladimir Zelensky, he says he plans to be at the summit to push for more support. Todd. All right. Thanks very much, John, for that. Well, Canada's prime minister is on his way to Europe for that NATO summit. CTV's Kevin Gallagher is traveling with Justin Trudeau and has this preview of what we can expect. The Prime Minister is travelling to Lithuania to attend what top observers are calling the most consequential NATO summit since the end of the Cold War. Justin Trudeau and other allies are united in their determination to assist Ukraine in its fight. Still, there are divisive issues. Not all NATO members agree with Canada's support of Ukraine to one day become a full defence pact partner. The Prime Minister will also be under pressure to increase defence spending as Canada is one of 20 countries not meeting the 2% of GDP target. Is 2% of GDP really a measure of military capability? And I don't think it is, and I think that's the position of the Canadian government. What is clear is that we're deficient to many capabilities across all of three of the armed services, and we need to pick up our, pull up our socks and pick up our game in terms of procurement. Tomorrow, Trudeau will visit Canada's largest military overseas deployment in Latvia. More than 700 Canadian Armed Forces members lead a NATO battle group there. 
Last year, the defense minister promised to increase the size of the group to around 4,000 troops. Though unlike the UK, Germany and the US, Canada has yet to reveal how it will reach this goal. Kevin Gallagher, CTV News, Ottawa. And on the eve of the summit, Ukrainian Canadians have a message for NATO, and today they took that message to the streets. Our brave and unbreakable soldiers have been given their lives for our freedom. Members of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress holding rallies in both Halifax and Calgary. They say this week's meeting is the perfect opportunity to make a concrete commitment to allow Ukraine to join the alliance. As we all know, Ukrainian army right now is the most experienced army in Europe. And I think uh, NATO will be uh, stronger with Ukraine than without Ukraine. The demonstrators point out that Ukraine's membership has been on NATO's agenda for the past 15 years. In British Columbia, hundreds of striking port workers held another protest in Vancouver today. They, along with thousands of others, have been off the job for more than a week, shutting down dozens of ports in the province. Talks are back on, but the strike is costing the Canadian economy billions of dollars. And as CTV's Ben Nesbitt explains, both sides are still far apart. From ports to picket lines, for the ninth straight day, thousands of BC longshore workers remained off the job. We've stood up and said enough is enough. This is where the line in the sand is drawn. Talks between the two sides fell apart early last week, but resumed Saturday. The BC Maritime Employers Association says it met with workers, proposing a committee and independent arbitrator on key concerns around maintenance work, which along with pay and automation are key issues of the strike. But the union doesn't seem interested. We do not want the federal government to get involved in our business. We must force them to the table. We must tell them to come to the table. It's estimated the strike is bleeding a billion dollars out of the Canadian economy each day. In BC, the forestry industry, one of the province's most vital, is sounding the alarm. If it goes on any longer, we're expecting to see some, some curtailments in production. The industry employs roughly 50,000 people and forest products make up 15% of the cargo at the port of Vancouver. There's fears the strike could impact long-standing international relationships. Japan and, and China, those are two major markets for us and, and they're looking for a reliable, consistent supply. The union has repeatedly pointed to the record profits recorded by shipping companies during the pandemic. It says they want their fair share. We are not asking for wages that are unrealistic. Despite calls from business leaders and provincial politicians to issue back-to-work legislation, a representative from the federal labour minister's office tells CTV News they will not look past the bargaining table. Ben Nesbitt, CTV News, Vancouver. Canada's premiers are holding a pivotal meeting in Winnipeg this week to try and fix our country's faltering health care system. Part of the agenda is how to spend the $46 billion that's been promised by the federal government. The biggest problems to tackle, overcrowding, understaffing, and long wait times. That's an agonizing scenario that one family went through firsthand after a loved one studying in Montreal almost died while he was waiting for care. Here's CTV's Christine Long. Christos Lianos is from Kingston, Ontario, yet studies in Montreal. Mid-June, he suddenly fell sick and went to the Royal Victoria Hospital they, to see a doctor. I'm having a 40-degree fever and, you know, pain in my lower right abdomen, and I think it's my appendix. Liano says he was told to expect a 10-hour wait and was twice given Tylenol for his pain. There was, rough, like, roughly about 100 people in that waiting room. And uh, from what I was told by one of the nurses, there was only two doctors available at the time, which I later learned is their standard procedure. His parents came from Kingston and after waiting 15 hours... At that point, we had felt like we had hit a wall and we were getting quite frustrated, I, uh, my mother especially. And, you know, she, it got to a point where she got very frustrated with the, one of the nurses and, um, you know, they had security come up and threatened to kick us out if uh, we didn't calm down. The family made the decision to drive home and Liano says he was admitted to the Kingston General Hospital after a four-hour wait. It was appendicitis. My appendix had burst. 
His appendix was removed and he spent 10 days in intensive care to clear the infection. I'm not a doctor, I'm a lawyer. As a human being, if I see someone suffering at emergency ward, I want to take care of that person. That person was suffering hell and was not given the attention needed. In an email, the MUHC says the emergency department was at 197% capacity, with over 30 patients from the previous evening still waiting to be seen. Those patients were of higher priority or had been there longer. We can say what if, but had, would I be here today is a very good question. And, you know, who knows? It, it is very possible that I could have died in that waiting room. Christine Long, CTV News, Montreal. Time is ticking for a group of Indigenous protesters to take down a blockade they've set up at a landfill in Manitoba. City of Winnipeg demanding they clear out by noontime on Monday. The entrance has been blocked since last Thursday. But some are refusing to back down until local landfills are searched for the remains of two Indigenous women. CTV's Taylor Brock has more for us. Since Thursday, protesters have been at Brady Landfill blocking one of the paths in. The barricade went up after the province announced it would not support a search of Prairie Green Landfill, saying there were health concerns for workers. Cambria Harris disagrees, saying a landfill search feasibility study showed it was possible to be done safely. The provincial government denying to move forward with the search, but instead put a memorialization on top of the landfill, saying that it's okay for that landfill to remain a gravesite. The remains of Cambria Harris's mother, Morgan Harris, along with Mercedes Myron are believed to be at Prairie Green Landfill. The two women, along with Rebecca Contois and an unidentified woman, Buffalo Woman, are all believed to be victims of the same serial killer, their bodies thrown in a garbage bin. People are they're, they're angry at what we're doing. They don't understand why we're here. My mom was in that dumpster for 10 days and then Mercedes was dumped. She's hoping the blockade sends a message, but time is running out. The city of Winnipeg has given the group until Monday at noon to clear the roadway. Protesters have also faced pushback from people wanting to use the landfill. On Sunday, a driver tried to drive through the blockade. Earlier the same day, a man dumped soil and clippings on the protesters' red dress murals. Ironically enough, you brought cedar, a lot of it. And cedars are protection medicine. So you've covered her, you blanketed her in protection. Diane Busquet says she's not backing down on Monday. The city of Winnipeg says in a statement the city is hopeful that the group currently blockading the main roadway into Brady Landfill will respect the order and vacate the roadway by noon tomorrow. It would not say if police would be present. The last thing we need is our people getting arrested and thrown into jail when there's actual criminals out there stealing our women and picking them up. Harris wants more mental health supports for Indigenous women, helping prevent them from being in vulnerable positions like her mother was. Taylor Brock, CTV News, Winnipeg. Coming up, revamping one of Canada's most iconic buildings. There's little things that are kind of hidden in, into the pieces. Behind the scenes of a major parliamentary project. Plus, a thrill-seeking grandma's special birthday celebration. Our country's largest ever heritage restoration project is well underway in Ottawa. It's a massive overhaul of Centre Block to update and modernize the Canadian Parliament. The most challenging phase is strengthening a structure that dates back a century and making room for a new visitor's centre underground. CTV's Judy Trin with an in-depth look behind all the scaffolding. The crowds on Parliament Hill are distracted by the pomp and ceremony. Sounds and sights obscuring what has been a construction zone since 2019. Each day, more than 450 construction workers are on site. Some perched on top of the Peace Tower, 90 meters high. Others deep below. Since excavation began, 40,000 truckloads of bedrock have been removed. In this hole, 25 meters deep, a new Parliament Visitor Centre will be built 
most of it underground. A new three-story underground facility that will become the new front door for Parliament. And that upper floor of the Parliament Welcome Centre will be for the visiting public. So we'll have spaces like uh, for exhibits, a multimedia theatre, uh, educational classrooms for on-site educational programming that will become a destination in and of itself. Building the new visitor centre and the restoration required removing 22 and a half million pounds of hazardous materials. While modernizing this century-old heritage building, project managers are aiming to be carbon neutral. We have to balance restoring the heritage with universal accessibility, with sustainability, with meeting modern requirements of Parliament and creating greater access for Canadians. Restoration involves touching up the gold foil in the Senate's plaster ceiling and cataloging each heritage asset like stained glass windows and bringing new life to sculptures of wood, metal and stone while unearthing secrets like the artists who carved their own faces into their work. But there's little things that are kind of hidden in, into the pieces uh, that you sometimes uh, can note. It's very in keeping with uh, the Gothic style actually for carvers to kind of leave little hidden little gems there that are kind of out of sight until you actually get up on the scaffold. This project will take more than a decade to complete. Despite the pandemic, it's been on budget and on time so far. A cost range for both buildings in the four and a half to five billion dollar range. And, and we spent about 500 million of that to date. So we're on track uh, both from a schedule and cost perspective. This is Canada's biggest, most complicated heritage restoration project. To get more than a sneak peek, visitors will have to wait another nine years until 2032 before they can see it in person. Judy Trin, CTV News, Ottawa. It was a record-setting day at the Calgary Stampede, but it wasn't the number of people that clinched the title, but rather the pancakes. <laughs> The greatest outdoor show on earth celebrated Family Day today. That drew a huge turnout with thousands waiting in line for hours to get their free breakfast. I had to just qualify 15 pancakes from today's attempt, unfortunately, but the final total is 17,182 pancakes. And that made it official, getting the stampede into the Guinness Book of World Records for the most number of pancakes served in eight hours. And the canine crowd got into the action as well, and yes, enjoyed some pancakes too that were made especially for them. All right, still ahead for us. The Indigenous artist using ancestral teachings to paint his way to a top prize. An up-and-coming artist from Saskatchewan is using his past to help launch his future by showcasing his heritage. On tonight's Indigenous Circle, CTV's Allison Bamford has more on the man and his award-winning piece that's now getting national attention. This piece is in what Stephen Thomas calls its ugly phase. Just before you put in the details, there's a, there's a part in there where it's just a mess of colour. If it's done right, that mess usually turns into something like this. People ask me how I do it and I try to sum it up with uh, practice patience, purpose and prayer. Thomas picked up his first paintbrush as a kid. Only in the last year, he plunged into his craft full time, using his talents to portray traditional teachings passed down to him from his mother and grandparents. It's using what I know and and again, have, so I can have that confidence in what I paint and what I put out into the world that, you know, I did my research. I live here for, you know, so many decades, I, I'm comfortable in putting this out. Thomas's leap of faith recently paid off. This piece winning the 2022 Peace Hills Trust Indigenous Art Contest. There's me, <laughs> there's my daughter, my son. Mom, grandma, grandpa, they're all there. Strength of Our Prayers is a visual representation of Thomas asking his ancestors for help. The winning piece helped him get his foot in the door at Becky's Place, a local indigenous store in Fort Quapel, and the only shop in Saskatchewan that sells his work. And I was blown away. You take a look at his buffalo, his eagle, and you swear you're sitting right in front of them. You know, it's so real. Hopefully it'll inspire in some way or bring people some kind of 
positive feeling or whatever it is. As for Thomas's inspiration, he finds it in past work that hangs on his wall, hoping to repeat his success in the next national art contest that he enters. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Pasqua, First Nation. An adventurous grandmother from Nova Scotia celebrated her 80th birthday with a leap of faith. Check this out. Quite literally, Margaret Sullivan's ninth decade got off to a flying start. She says skydiving from a plane had been on her bucket list for a long time. Her nervous family was on hand to cheer her on. And by the way, she has more adventures planned, including as well a swim on Nova Scotia's Cape Sable Island and a trip to Canada's north. All right, after the break, a post-apocalyptic fantasy that spawned a fairy tale romance. We we'll leave you tonight with a story from British Columbia about a novelist who refused to give up on his passion for writing, and as a result, he ended up on the path to love. CTV's Adam Sawatsky now on a literary journey that went from the bowling alley to a wedding chapel. Once upon a time, in a small town bowling alley, there was a human pin setter named Jason. And we've been told that we can get faster than machines. But despite physically jumping between lanes and mentally keeping track of different games, Jason was bored. I spend the time mostly daydreaming. Which led to writing a novel in his head. Gritty, dark, survival story. And while he wrote about a young man overcoming the oppressive forces of a post-apocalyptic world, Jason was inspired by his character to wage a real-life battle against depression and anxiety. It helped me grow because I had to force myself to reach out to learn more just so I could keep up with this guy. Jason found himself feeling less fearful, more optimistic, and after No End, A Survivor's Diary was published, started working on a sequel, and hired a professional editor in the U.S. to help. It, it really drew me in, and it made me want to know more about him, too. Over the next few years, Jason and Angel formed a friendship online that turned unexpectedly romantic. And this just came out of nowhere and blindsided me. I, I just had this need to just be there with him. So they decided Angel would fly from Florida to BC, Jason would learn how to drive so he could pick her up at the airport, and they would meet in person for the first time. The first thing that I did was just run up and hug him. I saw her and I just, I knew. Well, Canada was nothing like Angel expected, like igloos and snow all the time. The love they felt for each other was beyond imagination. It really feels like living a fairy tale. So Jason proposed, Angel said yes, which led to them both saying, I do. And as much as writing gave my life purpose, my life gave my life meaning. A year later, the couple's living together, writing the third more optimistic book in Jason's series together, and feeling grateful that this young pin setter never gave up on pursuing his passion. When you want something badly enough in life, you just have to go after it. Dreams can come true and love is real. And so too, they say, are happily ever afters. Adam Sawatsky, CTV News, Yubo. And there you have it. That's going to do it for us tonight. I'm Todd Vander Hayden. For Sandy Ronaldo and all of us here at CTV National News, thank you for watching and have a great rest of your evening.